So um, you cannot seek to dismantle oppression. You cannot seek to overthrow the, the system of, uh, that is oppressing you by going in the ways and the means that the uh, system sees necessary or they dictate for you, right? He says that will leave us in a state of groveling flunkies, right? This is what he, his, that's Huey's claim. Also very similar to what Malcolm was arguing. Then he also makes the claim of the power of the oppressor is in the submission of the people. Think about what that means. The power of the oppressor is in the submission of the people. And then you start to see um, Huey P. Newton's ideas take more of a global context, right? He says that um, there's more Black people in America than the and then total populations of many countries now enjoying full citizenships within the United Nations, okay? So he's saying there's more Black folks in America, just in America, than some countries who have full citizenship and full participations in the United Nations, right? So again, think about what Malcolm would want him to do when he returned back from Mecca, right? What was his main objective? Was to take the United States before the United Nations for violating human rights issues. Huey P. Newton is taking, picking up on this and he's saying, well, look, from a standpoint of numbers, from a standpoint of the population, there's more Blacks in America than certain countries who are receiving the benefits of the UN. So how is it that we are not able to position ourselves that we can receive the benefits from the UN. Um, so then he, he also articulates or he claims or argues that the black radical movement, the black power movement must move from the grassroots up to the black bourgeoisie, right? So no one should be left out in this process of, the, of black liberation. We need the grassroots movement just as much as we need the uh, bourgeoisie. And then he talks about this notion of guerrilla warfare. Um, so I definitely want to get into that because I don't know if you guys were familiar what guerrilla warfare is, uh, or if you guys looked it up. I, I'm curious to that to know what you guys thought about that. And then he he ends the he ends the speech towards the end of the speech. He uses Mao Say Tung quote to end the use of the gun or to end the need of the, for the gun, you have to pick up the gun, right? So to create a war, to create a society that is warless, to create a society without war, you must in fact go to war, right? So this is how he kind of closes that speech out. So again, something to think about. So moving from in, in defense of self-defense to black power to pan-Africanism, um, so, Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, he's a very interesting figure. Um, this is one individual whose life has been dedicated to revolution, to the liberation of African people. Um, from the time he gets out of high school to he enrolls in Howard University, um, he's been involved in organizing. He went from an organization called NAG to the organization called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, which allowed him to do a lot of organizing in the South around um, voter suppression, around allowing people to get to vote. At the time when he was organizing in Mississippi, Mississippi is at the loudest county, Mississippi is where he was organizing, which was a 99% black county, right? So his idea was to go in, organize this county, get them to vote, and get them to place people from that county in positions of power, right? So this is his um, organizing efforts as he gets into SNCC. Very closely aligned with Martin Luther King and the student, I'm sorry, in the Southern Le Christian Leadership Confer Conference. Um, so they're working hand in hand in the Southern movement, right? Keep in mind the distinction I drew between how the movement, the movement with Martin Luther King in the South looked and then how the movement in Malcolm X looked in the Northern cities, right? There's a difference. So mind you, Kwame is from New York. He's actually from Trinidad, moves to New York, goes to Howard, which is in DC, and then travels to the South to organize, right? So this is a, a person with New York and Northern sensibilities organizing in the South with Martin Luther King. But he's attentive to what's going on in the North, right? He's from New York. So he knows about Malcolm X. He's hearing about from his homeboys what Malcolm X is doing and talking about. In fact, he was able to bring Malcolm X to Howard 
for a debate against Biden and Rustin, right? So he he sit in a position to where he's intimately tied to Martin Luther King, and he's a staunch student of Malcolm X. Um, once he leaves SNCC, he becomes the Minister of Information for the Black Panther Party. Um, in fact, when he was organizing in uh, Mississippi, the party that he organized, as I mentioned, he was trying to get the Blacks in Mississippi, which was 99% a Black community, he was trying to get them to vote, right? When you register as a political party, you have to have a mascot. And the mascot that Kwame came up with was the Black Panther. And the reason why Kwame came up with this idea of the Black Panther was because the um, makeup of a Panther is, it will not strike or it will not attack until it's placed into a corner, right? So Kwame identified Black people with the Panther in the sense that we won't, we'll, we'll take up nonviolence, but when you place us in the corner, we're gonna strike back and we're gonna strike in a way that you won't be able to deal with, right? So he calls the organized, the party that he organized in Mississippi, the Black Panther Party, right? So this picks up um, a lot of steam. In fact, there's people arguing over who will take over this title, the Black Panthers, um, since the party um, has taken place in Mississippi. Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale were the ones who were eventually come up with the title. So really this idea or this terminology behind the Black Panthers, although the Black Panthers political party was created by um, Huey P. Newton and, and um, Bobby Seale in Oakland, the idea originally came from Kwame Ture and his organizing efforts in Mississippi, right? So this is somebody who's from the North, organized in the South, and is now currently doing work in the North with the Black Panther Party, right? So he becomes their, um, their National Minister of Information. Kwame Ture would go on to organize um, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. He would also go on, he would in, in the last years of his life in Africa, um, organizing in Guinea with uh, Sekou Ture after leaving Ghana and organizing with Kwame Nkrumah who was the first president of the liberated Ghana. So when you talk about this notion of Pan-Africanism, Kwame Ture is the quintessential Pan-Africanist, right? So mind you, he started his organizing efforts right out of high school, right? So he's about your guys' age. When the Black Panther Party started, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, they were in junior college. They were 19 years old right around your guys' age, right? So when you talk about this idea of activism, when you talk about the idea of movement and movement being a, a, a youth, youth culture phenomenon is exactly right. That time has passed me, right? I, I, I did my time, I did my youth organizing when I was in my undergrad, right? Oftentimes we're positioned to believe that we're too young to do things that can drastically impact the world. These are two examples where that's not the case. Since the time Kwame graduated high school, he's been organizing at a very serious rate. Again, UP Newton and Bobby Seale were 19 when they created the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense, which in effect changed the world, right? Um, in Huey's speech, he talks about how what the government wants an unarmed populace. He mentions that, right? An unarmed populace is a slave populace, is what he says. So y'all heard of the term the wild, wild west, right? What, 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 what invokes, what kind of ideas are invoked when you hear the wild, wild west? What does that mean to depict? I feel like with like media and stuff like that, like a lot of people say like, it's like out in the open desert, like everybody's like, I guess like they think, I, when I hear Wild West, I think like desert and like, I guess, like towns in a way. Yeah. And so just and also an area of opportunity, right? And because of this area of opportunity, everybody was flocking west to try to get the gold, right? We had the gold rush, things that are taking place. But also what was happening, which makes it wild, was there was shootouts, right? All these, um, this cowboy area that also comes with this notion of the wild, wild west, right? So just like many of your Southern states where you have open carry license to where you can literally carry a gun um, in the street and it's not a problem, California was also an open carry state, right? That changed 
when um, Bobby Seale, which was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, they were trying, to, because of the Black Panther organization efforts, what they would do is if they seen somebody pulled over by the police in the Oakland area, they would follow them or they would stop and patrol that interaction, right? So they would make sure that the police were doing nothing that was illegal or violated the constitutional rights of the people who they were pulling over. When they would do these patrols, they would do these patrols armed, right? So they see somebody pulled over, they would park behind the police and watch them and make sure that they do their job the way that it should be done. If they seen something that was done in a way that it wasn't, they would step out the car, they would let them know that they're armed and they would ensure that the individual who they were patrolling, who the Black Panthers were watching over, was able to receive fair treatment and was able to make it home safely, right? But the key thing was they did this armed. Shotguns, handguns, all that, right? Because of this, Ronald Reagan, I believe, who was the governor at the time, was seeking to change legislation to make California no longer open carry state, right? Um, but Black Panthers got wind of this as they were going to make the vote up in Sacramento. The Black Panthers went up there as well. They went to sit on the Senate floor because that should be open to the public to observe. They had their guns with them, right? Um, as they're seeking to find the Senate floor, they take a wrong turn and they end up on the House, the floor of the House Representatives for Sacramento, right? So now the story comes out that 20 Black Panthers armed the, I'm sorry, 20 armed Black Panthers stole, stormed the um, state capitol in California, right? Which in, when effect, which in effect ensured that no longer you could carry open no, you can no longer use open carry laws in California, right? So now you have to have a concealed weapon permit or you must keep your firearm at home, right? So literally the notion of being able to carry arms in the state of California changed with the advent of the Black Panthers, right? So you see how they're literally changing the way that the world functions at a very young age. So let's get into um, from Black power to Pan-Africanism. Just as Huey P. Newton lays out his argument in the first um, paragraph, Kwame Ture does the same thing, right? He lays out and he articulates the importance of Pan-Africanism. One, he tells you what Pan-Africanism is, and then he lays out and, and goes into the importance of Pan-Africanism, right? Um, does everybody have a good grasp of what Pan-Africanism is, or do you need me to further articulate that? How about this? Can somebody tell the class what did you understood what you understood Pan Africanism to be based off of what Kwame Ture articulated? Well, uh, from what I understood, he he was um, describing Pan Africanism not as separate countries, but like as a whole continent. Right. So that, yeah. the whole of Africa is one, right? So we're not gonna be um, tripping off of the, the borders that were constructed through the Berlin Conference, right? So I'm not worried about Nigeria being separated from Ghana, Ethiopia being separated from Eritrea, Senegal being separated from the Congo, Africa as a whole is one. In the same regard, African people are one, right? So although I'm residing in America, I'm, no, I'm an African, right? And I'm no different from Africans on the continent for Africans who are located in the Caribbean um, from the Africans located in South America, right? So in effect, Jamaicans, you're African, right? Haitians, you're African. Brazilians, Brazil has like the third largest black population outside of the continent of Africa of black people, right? So all of those black people within Brazil are African. So this is the notion of what Pan-Africanism is. Um, and then he kind of, he, he, he says, is that he talks about the importance of history, right? And he says that Africans in the Western hemisphere, they always begin their encounter, they begin their history with the encounter with white supremacy, with whiteness, right? So you would start your history with enslavement. Africans on the continent always begin their history with the encounter with colonialism. So their history starts with colonialism. Kwame says that's an inaccurate methodology. That's an inaccurate approach to history, right? So if you think about this class, we didn't get into enslavement until about the second month of the semester, right? 
we dealt with what was going on in Africa prior to the presence of the European, right? For me, that's a pedagogical method, right? I never start a class dealing with the system of enslavement or the system of, of colonialism. I always deal with what happened prior to that, right? This is directly a method pulled directly from the work of Kwame Ture. That's something that through reading Kwame, I situated myself as a professor to never talk about African people from the standpoint of just being in enslavement or just being from a colonial standpoint. Always start before that process. Um, he also talks about, you know, Pan-Africanism is, is old as time itself, right? So when the first slave revolt start to take place, that's when you start to see the birth of Pan-Africanism. In the 20th century, you start to see Pan-Africanism being organized. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois held the uh, Pan-African Congresses in 1901. Um, I believe that was in London. Um, and then they were, subsequent ones would follow years after that, right? So Pan-Africanism could be traced back to about the 17th century according to Kwame, right? And to me, this is important. Um, and, and this is something through my intellectual studies I found to be true. And he claims that all African intellectual giants were baptized in Pan-Africanism. And he, and he runs through a list of um, intellectuals. W.E.B. Du Bois, right? He starts off with this notion of the talented 10th. We'll take the top 10% intellectuals within the black community, We'll educate them, we'll train them, and they'll be tasked to educate the rest of the 90%. That's how he starts off his intellectual career, right? He dies in Ghana, working for Kwame Nkrumah, producing the Africana, uh, the Encyclopedia Africana, right? So in effect, he is a Pan-Africanist. As I mentioned, he created the first Pan-African Congress in 1901. So you even see the, sh the, um, the shift of W.E. Du Bois' ideology as he goes through his life evolves. Um, Malcolm X, right? We read him two weeks ago. Starts off as a man, well, starts off as a street hustler, right? Um, goes through the Nation of Islam, and towards the end of his life, he's a Pan-Africanist. He's traveling abroad, telling the African leaders of nations the plight of Black folks in the in the Americas, and trying to bring that organization and efforts together, right? Um, I could go on, but the list remains true. So, to me, in my estimation. Of all these great intellectuals of Africa ended at the conclusion of Pan-Africanism, that has to be one of the highest ideological and activist, uh, activist platforms and frameworks to work through for the liberation of African people, right? So through my study, I would situate myself as a Pan-Africanist because I, I have yet to find a framework, an ideology or a theory that speaks to the liberation of all African people in a comprehensive nature like Pan-Africanism. Right. So in my estimation, that is the optimal and the ideal way to approach the liberation struggle for Black folks. Then he divides Africa into three groups, right? He says there's the progressive states, the states that achieved their independence. We have the neo-colonist states, so the states that are going through neo-colonialism, neo neo excuse me. Does everybody know or does anybody not know what neo-colonialism is? Anybody unfamiliar with neo-colonialism? Alyssa, you had a question? Yeah, can you elaborate on it, please? Yeah. So neo-colonial, so we understand what how colonialism is and we understand how that works. So what neo-colonialism is, is keeping that system of colonialism intact, right? But instead of a, a European running Africa, right? They'll pick somebody from the continent of Africa and have them run, Af run that state the same way. So the resources will still go to Europe. So let's take Ghana, for example, okay? Ghana was a um, British colony. So the British came in and they took over Ghana, right? Ghana was able to liberate themselves from British colonialism, they overthrew the British off their, off their country. Kwame Nkrumah was able to run Ghana for a couple of years. They had a coup d'etat and they placed someone else in power. The person who they placed in power after Kwame Nkrumah was an African from Ghana, but what he did was make sure all the resources, all the gold, all the labor were being filtered to Britain still, right? So although the face of the colonialism looks the same as, sorry, the face of colonialism looks different, right? It looks like the people who are being colonized 
but the way that it operates remains the same. Um, give us an example in our context, right? This is the, Biden will be the 46th president. Um, so that means 45 presidents all were white men, right? We had one black president, right? Barack Obama. But the way that the state operated remained the same. People who were in power remained in power, right? So the look of the president didn't change the way that the system in the state operated. So that in effect is neo-colonialism, right? I'm gonna make you feel a little bit better about your oppression because your oppressor will look like you, but I'm gonna still take all the resources. I'm gonna still take all the, um, the, the wealth that's being produced from the country, right? And I'm gonna still exploit you as a colonized entity. Does that make sense when I say the term neo-colonialism? Yeah, so just essentially a, a black face on white oppression or an indigenous face on white oppression, right? So we have the progressive states, the states that were able to throw off colonialism. We have the neo-colonialist states. And then he says the, the European settler colony states. So when you say, when you think about the European settler colony states, think about South Africa and apartheid, right? You had this Euro European entity come into South Africa, set up their base, and they're gonna settle in South Africa and not wanna leave South Africa, right? So that's a European settler colonial state. So what he's claiming or what he's um, calling for is the consolidation of the progressive states, right? So Ghana, Guinea, Senegal, right? These states that were able to overthrow colonialism, let them consolidate their powers, come together, and all of the Africans within the world support these states because they have already situated themselves in a, in a place to achieve, to achieve independence, right? And I was also very attentive to the way that both speeches concluded, right? There are similarities in, in both. And then I'm, I'm gonna read them and then we'll open it up to um, conversation. So I'll just read the last paragraph. This is starting with um, In the Defense of Self-Defense from Huey P. Newton. Blood, sweat, tears, and suffering of black people are the foundation of the wealth and power of the United States of America. We were forced to build America and if forced to, we will tear it down. The immediate result of this destruction will be suffering and bloodshed, but the end result will be perpetual peace for all mankind. So this is how Huey ends his speech. So for Kwame, he says, the African for at least 500 years has known neither peace nor justice. His wealth and his labor have built Western Europe and America. When these forces are, are harnessed for our benefit, the reconstruction of Mother Africa will be worthy of her glorious past. The setback in Ghana is no cause for dismay. So when you're talking about the setback in Ghana, that's just kind of what I explained with neocolonialism, right? Kwame Nkrumah was able to liberate Ghana. They had a coup d'etat. They got rid of Kwame Nkrumah and they placed a neocolonial uh, neo person in power. So that's the setback that Kwame's talking about. Um, the setback in Ghana is no cause for dismay. Pan-Africanists know setbacks are now, setbacks are not new to the African struggle. This one has not even been long. We are not afraid of the inevitable bloodshed, for beyond it, we see victory in the air. So there's a, a, a grave similarity between the way that they both ended those speeches. And if you think about the way that Malcolm ended this battle in the bullet speech, they're kind of picking up the same argument towards the end, right? So those are some of the things that I found of interest in the two speeches. Um, also, don't forget about the video that we watched. Um, I believe everybody has fishbowl. Um, if you haven't, you definitely want to speak up and get your particip participation points. Um, but if not, what we'll do is just open it up for um, broader classroom conversation. I'm curious to know your guys' thoughts about what you, re what you read and what you view. Can I speak? Even though yeah, yeah, sure. um, I was just, I thought it was interesting, like, um, for the, Black 
power the reading um how like back to what we we're saying how like often um, african-american like history is like not really told as its own like it's told just from slavery and that's pretty much like the main focus on it and it's like um i thought a quote was interesting how they said like it's never it's rarely recorded as the history of africans it's morally told like for like european history so like it's kind of like i thought it was saying like how even in like history it's not even told that it's, it's as their story it's told as like the colonizer's story yeah yeah that, that that's profound right like so he's saying one you won't even get history from a black context you only get it as it pertains to their context contact excuse me with europeans right so you're not even on the planet until you come in contact with european individuals yeah that, that's a very good point anyone else all right so let me do this then since um i want to pose you guys a question because i, I thought this idea was interesting. Um, I don't. I still don't know how I feel about it, if I agree or not. I think it's a, a very um, a large task to put on Black folks. Let me see. Let me find it real quick. All right. So it is our belief that the Black people in America are the only people who can free the world loosen the yoke of colonialism and destroy the war machine. Black people who are within the machine can cause it to malfunction. They can, because of their intimacy with the mechanism, destroy the engine that is enslaving the world. America will not be able to fight every black country in the world and fight, at a, and fight a civil war at the same time. It is militarily impossible to do both of these things at once. So I, I would love to hear y'all thoughts on that, right? Because it's, it's a lot going on within that passage, right? So one, according to the Black Panthers, Black people are the only one who are capable to free the world from this machine of, of oppression, right? So that's, that's one thing that we have to deal with, okay? He makes the claim, and then he supports his claim with, with theoretical evidence right so from there he says um we're within the machine and we can cause the machine to malfunction right um there's an intimacy that we have that black people have with the mechanism with the machine with the system of oppression we know it intimately right and because of that intimacy we know how to go about to the process of destroying the machine so there's two, there's kind of like two things on the table here. One, the claim that only black people could engage in this process of destroying the system of white inferiority. And then two, that's possible because of our intimate ties to the system of white inferiority, right? So with those two things that we have on the table, one, do we agree, right? And I'm asking you guys, do you agree or disagree? Um, and then two, the claim that he has, sorry, the, the theory that he has to support the claim, the intimacy that we have to the system, is that a good theory to support it? Do we agree with that? Do we disagree? Can we complicate that? Can we add to it? So let's deal with that for a moment. So do we agree with the claim? So listen, I hate to put you on the spot, but you are the only um, highly melanated person in this class, right? So he's talking to you directly. Um, how do you feel about being positioned as the only one that's capable of tearing down the system of white inferiority? Um, honestly, when I think about, like, I don't know, the, the idea of slavery, like, I don't, thinking about it, it still baffles me that, like, a whole entire race of people were just, like, able to be enslaved and, like, I don't know. So, um, when he, when he says, like, we're the only ones able to break it down, I guess I would kind of agree because, like, um, 
or no well honestly I don't know because like we um were the ones put in like you know this the the like the system is forced against us like or the system is pit pitted against us it like it does affect um you know other my or not minorities but like um marginalized groups yeah like it, it does affect them like you know immigrants and everything but the majority of like the uh, problems wrong with the system is um issues pitted against like you know um us yeah. but so i feel like in order to tear that down like we would have to you know fight back because it's you know against us so who else do we have to um you know like speak for us if we don't have ourselves yeah i don't know if you guys heard the adage right um if you black get back if you brown you down if you yellow you mellow if you white you all right or we could flip it if you white you all right if you yellow you mellow if you brown you could get down if you black get back right so what that speaks to is the racial hierarchy of oppression right so in western context in american context white sit at the top of the totem pole right yellow or asians will sit at the next tier down indigenous or brown people will sit below the asians and then the blacks will be at the very bottom of the top of the totem pole right so that's the uh, racial hierarchy of oppression and this is what Alyssa is speaking to right so if blacks occupy the bottom of that racial hierarchy it would only make sense that we would be the ones positioned to try to dismantle that system that places at the bottom right because if you think about that that um hierarchy in that structure Asians not so much because they're closer to white so they're closer to getting the advantages of that system right that's what, and that's why you get the term model minority this is where this is comes from right so also with that Asian community could say is well I'm not being treated as bad as the indigenous or brown community and I'm damn sure ain't getting treated as bad as those black folks so my situation ain't that bad right then in turn, if we go down a tier, we have um, the brown and the indigenous community to where, no, they're not as treated as well as the Asians, right? But they're also not as treated as bad as the blacks, right? So they also feel as they could be, in some regards, included into the system of oppression, right? The very bottom, there is no way that you could move up and there's nobody who you could say, well, at least I'm not being treated like that. Right? So you're stuck to deal with the circumstances of this oppression that you've been entrapped in. Um, we haven't read any Franz Fanon, but you know, he's he's an also he's another revolutionary theoretician, right? And he says that those who are the most oppressed are those who are most situated to alleviate the oppression, right? Because you feel those circumstances daily, right? When you go through at least once a week and you're hearing about somebody innocent being murdered that looks like you, you're going to be more inclined to want to end a system of police brutality because you're going to be impacted by it most, right? So I, I, I see Alyssa's point, right? I see Huey P. Newton's point from that regard, but I still don't know if I agree uh, and I still don't know if, he, if he's true. Other thoughts, what do you guys feel about this claim? You agree, disagree? I think there should be more added to it. Uh, um, I agree, but I also believe that there should be more added into it. Because like he was saying that um, black folks like know the system well. Like if like, just like if you know the system, you should be able to predict what will happen if like something starts. So having this sort of inside knowledge by being in the system, you should in turn be able to take it down yeah. or restructure it. Yeah, what, what, 
what does intimacy mean? What do you guys think of when you heard when he says we're intimately tied to this system? What, what does that make you think about? Who is someone that you're intimate with? Like it's, I guess you can say that that it's. Damn, I had it. Like it's supposed. It's like it's meant to be. Like it has to be. Not necessarily has. Or like. To. Think think about who who would you be intimate with? Who would you consider consider somebody that you're intimate with? It would be like a partner, right? Yeah. Yeah, like your boyfriend, your girlfriend, right? Those are individuals who you share intimacy with, right? Your partner. So it's kind of it's kind of odd. It's, it's odd. It's weird to think about black folks being intimate in a, in a structure of white inferiority, right? That, that sounds weird. But let's take a step back. If we position ourselves on the slave plantation, right? Now let's think about this notion of intimacy in a in in, in an enslaved context, right? Literally, the slave master would have a child, right? And Mammy or whoever was like the overseer of the enslaved children would also be tasked with the duties of raising the enslavers' children, right? So um, Mammy would also have to take care of the slave driver's children, right? So if she's lactating and she's producing breast milk, she has to breastfeed the slave master's children, right? So you talk about these notions of intimacy, that's a, that's a notion of intimacy, right? Um, we know from Tom, Thomas Jefferson that slave owners were intimate and had sexual relations with their enslaved Africans, right? So it's another level of intimacy, right? So oftentimes because of this sexual relations between the slave owner and the enslaved Africans, slaves or enslaved individuals and the overseer or the master's children would be brother and sister, right? So if the slave master has sex with my mom, right? That child, that offspring is now in effect my brother, right? Intimate relations that are being built within the slave system, okay? Um, oftentimes, so shit, when it, when it came time for dinner, who was making the dinner in the slave institution? Not the, not the overseers, right? Not the enslavers weren't making dinner. The people who were enslaved were the ones preparing the dinners, right? So you, again, you think about these notions of intimacy. So think about that context in regards to what Huey's talking about, right? So if you wanna overthrow an institution, if I make your food, right? and I wanna get rid of you, wouldn't it be easy just to poison your food? That's an easy way to go about overthrowing a system that's oppressing you, right? And that doesn't take a lot of effort, that doesn't take a lot of engagement in, in a war activity, right? And just sipping a little something in the drink, mixing that shit up, here you go boss, have a nice meal. That's, that's the end of that, right? So this is what Huey's kind of getting at when he talks about the intimacy of our relations and our ability to strike down against this system of oppression, right? Um, and, and I think one of the biggest, I guess, critiques that I have of that claim is temporal, right? Is, is in a space of time. Um, so the, the, the speech was written, with, I think it was 1967, okay? A lot has changed since then. The way that the oppression works is not strictly just a black issue, right? A lot of, I mean, there's, they say there's over 666 children in cages, right? That's not, those children aren't black children, right? So the way that this system is operating is evolved and it's changed. So while that claim may be true in 1967, things are a little bit different now, right? Also, the numbers of blacks in America in 1967 aren't what they were, aren't what they are now, right? So even this statistical claim is changed, right? So from that regard, we have to reposition our thinking. Um, yeah, so so I, I'll put that on pause, but I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts about this notion of black people being the only one 
that's situated or capable of overthrowing the system of oppression. Can I ask you something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's not that I disagree or agree. I'm just, I'm still kind of in the middle. Um, I feel like in some parts I see like how I can agree, but it's like hard because I feel like they, it's not that they're the only ones that can stop it. Like, I feel like there should definitely be like people like helping. Cause like, like you said, like, we're, like the pedestal or mm -hmm. but wow. in some way we're still, we can still like relate to like others even though like it may not be as bad, like I feel like it should be initiated by them, but we should definitely like join in because I feel like if it's initiated by like any other race, it's gonna be like, oh, well, why do you care? And it's not, you're not as bad as them. Yeah, that, that's true. But then like to flip it, right? Like how powerful would it be for a, a, a group to step up when you're not the one, the most oppressed, right? And, and think about, how much of a motivating factor that would be for the bottom of the barrel to see the people above them fighting for their rights, right? So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, Eileen, that's probably the conventional way of thinking, but if we are to problematize these notions a little bit, what could it produce to see those who have a better position than black folks fighting for the rights of all people, right? That's a very good point. Someone else was gonna say something, Alyssa? And yeah, I was like, um, okay, hearing, I don't know, after hearing, like, you know, and thinking a little bit more, I'd like to like recant okay. my, <laughs> what I said earlier, because honestly, thinking about it, look at the Black Lives Matter movement. Look how many people that aren't Black have, um, like, you know, are um, supporting it now. And like, there's, it's, it's, you know, even the fake white supporters or whatever, they're still spreading awareness. Like even nowadays, like the the just their their help, like it it can I don't know make it see be seen as like the big issue that it that it is, because when they're like oh yeah like the white people that the system is for they're against it there maybe it is something wrong with it, yeah. so I don't know you know hearing and like thinking a little more I guess I would uh, disagree with it and saying that like yeah we should be the ones to start it but we we do need help or you know it would require help to bring the system down or whatever at least it would happen faster with others involved right uh, anybody else disagree with the statement is there anybody like nah he's tripping i don't agree with that shit nah 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 any uh, any di dis dissenters and it's okay um, to be go ahead yeah i would i would i would say i I disagree in this time period for the reason being that everyone is helping, like everyone, we're um, all the minorities are are being oppressed by white people anyways. So I feel like um, the Black Lives Matter movement, I guess you can put into perspective, is, is not only like expressing awareness for the lives of, um, black people but also like giving giving us a pathway or like uh if giving us a pathway or like a oh oh just a way to to show that the way that um uh, this government was built to be against black people or was built on top of slavery uh rather than being built on everyone to be free or whatnot and i find it very find that very important. So that's why I don't really agree with it. But um, I was I was to take into consideration that back then, like in the 60s, I guess you can say, or when when was it really? Mm -hmm. Like 70s? 60, 67. Okay. Yeah. So like back then, I guess he can say that, he, I guess he has a point in, in, in that time frame because like, um, not a, everyone to me, like from everything that I've read and like researched about, I guess you can say, there's always been like, you never hear of any other minority um, helping out, I guess, in the civil rights movement. But, and if you do, it's very rare, but now it's like, it's not rare at all. Like everyone's trying to fight for everyone's rights. And I feel like this new generation coming can really change the, change the outcome of a lot of things. Yeah, um, I, I, ho I wholeheartedly agree with you. The only thing I would, I would amend, Cecilia, um, 
if all people are marginalized against one in the one group, then those groups cannot be the minority, right? And and I know we've been trained to think about ourselves in terms of minority, but that's in effect not the case, right? We're actually the opposite of that. Um, so this is a little sticker thing, just kind of gets us to think about things in a different way, right? Um, anybody heard of the Brown Berets? You guys never heard of the Brown Berets? Yo, all right. Um, okay, Andrea, thanks, somebody. Yeah, I, you... I, I heard of it. Um, my and... kindergarten teacher, I think, if I remember, she would tell me stories because she was a part of it, if I'm correct. Can you kind of give us a little bit more insight with kind of some of the stories that she would tell you guys? Um, she would just uh, tell me that she would just like, because she was in middle school during the time it happened, and like, sorry, it's sorry um, a lot of people would like oppress her just for being like a, a Latina woman. So she would tell me that one day when she was like at school, uh, if I remember correctly, some like Armenian, she, she said um, were like, being really racist towards her just because she was wearing a brown beret and was a part of the movement. And that was like the one story she told me that really stuck to me. Like they would just oppress her for being like a Latina. Mm, okay. So what the brown berets were, were the offshoot of the Black Panther Party, right? So it was the indigenous people forming themselves in likeness to the Black Panther parties, but instead of, you know, they weren't Black, so they were all indigenous. So that's what the identity they are formed around. I would vastly suggest that you guys research that and look that up, especially for those who are in East Los Angeles. There's a very rich history of the Brown Berets in East Los Angeles. Um, I, I, you can't, probably can't do a lot now with the whole COVID situation, um, but there's a, a deep, deep, deep rich history um, of the Brown Berets, especially around our campus um, and in the um, surrounding areas of our campus. But again, this kind of speaks to the fact of what Alyssa and Cecilia were talking about, right? This is like, yes, the Black Panthers started this thing. And this is even in the 60s, right? So this is in Huey P. Newton's time. Yes, the Black Panthers started, and that's why they call themselves the vanguard of the revolution. They started the revolution. But even then, they branched out into other factions, right? You had the Brown Berets. Um, there was an Asian faction of the Brown Berets. They even had the Gray Berets, which were old people that supported the, the Black Panther Party, right? So what you see from a historical standpoint is typically African people kick off these movements and other people who are marginalized and who are oppressed are keen to what's happening and they see how they're also oppressed and they jump on board with the fight as well, right? And, and I think that is fundamental to having a global revolution, right? Because let's, let's call it what it is. The oppression that we see here in, United, in the United States has branched out to other parts of the world, right? Globalization and imperialism and colonialism has taken these systems of oppression and transported it everywhere, right? South America is dealing with the same problems. Africa is dealing with the same problems, right? So it has to be global if you're seeking to get rid of the system. With that being said, you're kind of selling yourself short just to focus on one entity, right? Um, but what I do feel, if you're talking about addressing issues that specifically affect black folks, right? Then it's gonna be on black folks to solve those issues. Like that, to me, that, that's just a fundamental reality that that only makes sense, right? Yes, other people can become in, involved and assist with that, but the thrust of that movement should come from the community that's being impacted. Um, let's get one more comment from somebody we haven't heard of before we call it a day. So uh, Lizette, Brizza, Sandy, Ingrid, uh, George, Esperanza, Chelsea, Diana, Nicoyo, Nico any of you guys? So I was thinking the same thing pretty much as you guys that, um, that obviously like, I, I kind of, I disagree with the, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm conflicted with the quote, but um, 
that definitely it should be started by black people or just the people that were that are mainly being oppressed by the group and um but everybody else should join in as well like it can't just be on the shoulders of black people because I feel like they've just been through so much like they can't just take all of it you know like for themselves just to you know fight that fight alone I feel like everybody else should join in and kind of help yeah yeah I mean, there's just that question of ethics, right? Like, what society do you want to live in? Are you comfortable living in a society where a certain segment can be treated a certain way and certain segments don't? Like, is that something that you feel is ethical? Is that something that you are comfortable with, right? And if that's not the case, then what are you doing to change that? It's just like, we don't even put it, make it deeper than that, right? That's just a fundamental reality of what we're dealing with. Um, did anybody watch the video? It's like 12 minute video. A little bit. I, I'm curious to hear um, your guys' thoughts on the video, the language that was used, and, and the performative nature of the video. I'm, I'm curious if anybody picked up on that. No. Well, I was listening to last night when I showered, and like, <laughs> and it, it was like, it was kind of moving, like like the words like they were very um articulate with with their word the with their word diction yeah like they just made it powerful in a sense it was it's poetic right it's a poetry too. yeah and, and to me like you start to see the early stages of hip-hop and the way that they phrase a lot of their terminology right like it um it's very rhythmic you know um if you if you like study battle rap you know, y'all know that when, I'm, when I say battle rap, y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, there's two rappers that don't get along, so they put out a record to diss the other rapper. Okay. Um, it it kind of, to me, it, it's similar to that type of performance, right? Um, calling them crackers, calling them honkies, right? Like, so it's, it's also this this idea of, have y'all, you, you heard of playing the dozens? Right? Like, so you just talk shit, right? Like, you, you're, on the home, you're on the playground with your home, you're gonna clown his shoes, you'll clown his, you know what I mean? So like, that they brought that element into their ideological argumentation, right? And, and I found that fascinating. And then when you look at the cultural phenomenon that the Black Panther Party became, I think a lot of that was, was attributed to, to that element, right? They're, they're clowning, like literally clowning these high ranking political figures, you know, um, coupled with the, the aesthetic that they had, right? the black leather jackets, uh, black glasses indoors, the black berets, right? It was a cool that this movement exhi exhibited that allowed it to go global, right? So if you weren't able to, um, to watch the video, watch it, it's only 12 minutes, but it just kind of gives you a, a, a sense of just the culture of the Black Panther Party. It's one thing to read it on paper, but just to hear it performed and just to see the whole presentation of it is it, it, moving, right? It's something to, um, you can see how this becomes a global phenomenon. Um, so with the last minute, we're, what, we're, what we're gonna do going forward with the semester, we're gonna get into like poetry and lyricism. Um, is there anybody that's into poetry here on the on this call already that maybe you can start helping me find? All right. um, I have some black feminist poets that, that I'm thinking about and then I'm thinking about also like some of the, um, what we call classical black poets, like your Nikki Giovanni, um, Amiri Baraka and things like that. Um, so I'll post some poems on the Google Classroom site no later than Friday. So that way you guys have some time to view them. Um, it won't be a lot, just something to kind of read through, just kind of get your mind going in the way that, um, cause remember we're in a oral traditions class, right? So we're. Um, what we're doing is looking at how this oral tradition has shifted over time, right? And what I think you'll see, I mean, if you do go back and listen to the video on the Black Panthers, that sounds vastly different from what Martin Luther King was talking about, which seems vastly different from what Malcolm X was, not vastly, it's a little bit closer to Malcolm X, but it's different, right? Um, and then what you'll hear in some of these poems is them picking up what they've done with the Black Panther parties and evolving that style of argumentation as well. So it's a, it's a genealogy of the oral tradition. So I'll, I'll have about three or four poems for you guys to go through. Um, 
yeah, so just be attentive to that. If there's any questions, please email me and we could um, get those addressed. Other than that, you guys have a good weekend. Um, be safe and I will see you next Tuesday. Peace. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you have a good one. Thank you, Professor. No worries. Also, I'm gonna email you like yeah. not right after class because I have another class, but. Yeah, maybe. please do so I can be, because I'll forget, bro. I got so much going on, please. Okay. Sandy, you good?